Hi, everyone. This is Jason Bjork of Wall Street for Me Street. Welcome back to another Wall Street for Me Street podcast interview. Today's special guest is a returning guest, and I'm really excited to talk to him as I think we're seeing the Austrian theory of the business cycle play out now after about 15 years of an artificial boom. And now the Fed, Federal Reserve Bank's interest rate hikes over the last 12 months, it looks like it's finally causing the bust in the Austrian theory of the business cycle. Robert Murphy, thank you for joining me. Thanks for having me, Jason. Glad to be here. So for our listeners out there who are not familiar with Robert, I'll just go over his bio really quick. He's a senior fellow with the Mises Institute. He's the author of numerous books, including one that just absolutely trashes Paul Krugman called Contra Krugman, Smashing the Errors of America's Most Famous Keynesian. And also one of my favorite books that I read many years ago, The Politically Incorrect Guide to Capitalism, the Politically Incorrect Guide book series available on audio, Audible Audiobook, very good beginner series for libertarianism, Austrian school economics, and capitalism. And he's also the host of the Bob Murphy Show, the podcast. So, Robert, I want to get your thoughts on all this stuff that's happening the last two or three years. The Federal Reserve Bank and other central banks just do insane amounts of currency creation the last two and a half, three years, many trillions of dollars. I think the Federal Reserve Bank just in the last two and a half, three years created about six trillion in new currency units. The Fed expanded their balance sheet. And now the last 12 months and we're recording this interview on Tuesday, April 25th, 2023, the Federal Reserve Bank has been hiking interest rates for the last 12 months. Do you think that this is kind of the classic example of the Austrian theory of the business cycle playing out in real life? Oh, yeah, definitely. And it's, you know, obviously with each business cycle, there's nuances. And, you know, after the fact, you can kind of add some flavor to it. And, you know, with the housing, you know, in other words, it's not always a housing boom bust, that sort of thing, even though that's what a lot of Austrians, you know, if they think the Austrian theory is the framework that helps explain what happened in the mid 2000s. And, um, but, but yes, to answer your question, it, it was pretty textbook that the Fed flooded the market with, you know, unprecedented, even compared to what happened right after 2008 amounts of liquidity. Interest rates got pushed down to rock bottom levels, like as low as they could go. And then they raised rates, um, you know, the yield curve inverted, if we want to talk about that. And then, um, you know, now and now we see as the as rates are rising and um, inter, the inflation price inflation rate is coming down. That I think most people are pretty sure we're going to enter into a pretty bad recession or depression. It, all the distortions. I mean, we could have uh, even worse stagflation because, according to shadow stats, the real inflation rate is still much higher than what the Fed says with the consumer price index. I mean, we were looking at stagflation rates in the 14, 15, 16 percent at one point. Um, over the last six to eight months before the uh, the official inflation rate started coming down. Yeah. And it's, you know, so I, I have uh, people before have asked me to look at the shadow stats website. I don't know that like, you know, in, in terms of like, is, is his number, the aggregate, is that the, you know, the accurate thing or not, but certainly I've seen his, his methodology and each of the adjustments he makes. I, I, you know, there it's, it's, I understand why he's, he's doing that and there, there is a basis for it. So Yes, and it's certainly true that the way they measure in price consumer price inflation now is not the way they measured it like in 1981, for example. And so it's not exactly an apples to apples comparison. Exactly. So for our listeners who are not familiar, I know there's the theory going around that John Williams is this crazy crackpot libertarian, but actually he used to work for the government. So he used to do as his day job Monday through Friday, he used to do this and make the consumer price index. So he just tracks the older formulas and shows how they've changed over the years. Right. Yes. Yeah. So like I say, if you, if you go look at any of the components, um, you know, it, it's not like it's crazy stuff. It's it's like he said, yeah, this is the way they used to do it, and so if you made that adjustment now, you know, this this is what would happen. So, uh, yeah, it's it's not like I say, it's not that these are crazy things. So, some of the numbers, you know, is is was it consistently running that high the whole time? I understand why some people, you know, are, are have doubts about you know the magnitudes, but certainly the direction. I, I agree with that. They vastly understate. I mean. Just to give your listeners an example, maybe you hit this all the time, but you know the so-called hedonic adjustment, where it's like, well, you know, yeah, sure, a, a car is more expensive now than it used to be if you just look at the, in terms of number of dollars for a new car, but a car now is is better than it used to be. You know, like the tires are better, you know, power steering and blah blah blah, and that's all true, but still, it, that gives the analyst a lot of wiggle room. Like in other words, if you're saying that, oh, well, we're so even though it's what I'm making numbers up, even though it's 20% more dollars measured nominally, if the quality went up 20%, then really it's the same. 
And so we're going to plug that into zero well, percent inflation. That's kind of misleading. Oh yeah, it's very misleading. I mean, the hedonic adjuster may even say that it's down five percent. <laughs> may even say it's a deflator. <laughs> yeah, right. Depending on what you're, yeah, if you're plugging, you know, computers or something, yeah, they they could definitely do that. So again, it's you know, it's not that it's insane. You know, I understand where they're coming from. You know, the the Fed economists doing those adjustments, but my point is. If they know that, oh, wow, inflation's running, you know, by which they mean consumer price inflation's running hot, that gives them an institutional incentive to, you know, err on the side of when they're making all those little adjustments because it's not purely scientific. There's a lot of judgment calls being made even within the framework. So, again, it's you can understand why if they know it would be in our interest to, you know, I guess, you know, the BLS is the one that's officially releasing the numbers, but when they make all those adjustments, if they know they want to keep it down, then they have the means to do that. And they're not, quote, lying. So this team of PhD economists that's working at the Federal Reserve Bank, do you think that they understand the law of unintended consequences that in 2020, 2021, when they're creating all these currency units and they're trying to do bailouts, they're picking and choosing winners and losers, they're trying to prevent businesses, small, small businesses, large corporations from failing, Wall Street banks from failing, do you think that they understand the unintended consequences long term of all this currency creation? Or do you think that they can just tinker like a Keynesian and just pull all these levers and magically they raise interest rates and all of a sudden the inflation is gone? You know, if they're trained economists, they're obviously aware of the, the concept of unintended consequences. You know, they're certainly aware that there are schools of thought that think that, you know, they like I'm sure at this point, everybody who has a degree in economics knows of the Austrian theory of the business cycle, but they do think it's very quaint and, you know, not very sophisticated. And they also believe, I think that like, Oh no, like, sure. If, I mean, in other words, their own history, the federal reserve's institutional history is they now, you know, they were persuaded by Friedman and Schwartz that the fed if not caused, at least greatly exacerbated the Great Depression. You know, and Ben Bernanke famously said to Milton Friedman in an event honoring him, something like, you were right, we did it, but thanks to your work, we won't do it again. Something like that. And that was, you know, shortly before the 2008 are, crisis. So are you referring to what Milton Friedman and Anna Schwartz, they co-authored this paper saying that the Federal Reserve should have printed more money during the uh, post-October 1929 crash, and that was one of the main reasons that the Great Depression of 1929, uh, post-October 1929 was caused? Well, right. So it was, yeah, it was in a, a book, you know, uh, I think called like a monetary history of the United States, something like that. I might not have the title right, but yes. So originally, you know, coming out of the 30s and 40s, the Keynesian orthodoxy said that, oh, central banks, they didn't, you know, they 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 were, they ran out of ammo, you know, they, they couldn't, there really was nothing more they could do. They were pushing on a string because we were in a liquidity trap and that's why governments needed to run budget deficits. And then Friedman and Schwartz came along and they said, oh, no, it the problem was they fell asleep at the wheel, like in the United States in particular, um, that they said that, yeah, the, they so what you said, Jason, was right. They, they thought that because the public was panicked in the early 30s and pulling their money out of the banks, the Fed should have stepped in and greatly inflated the monetary base to offset, you know, what, what the public was doing. And since the Fed didn't do that. That's why the overall money supply measured by like M1 or M2 contracted by a third in the early 30s. And that's why you had, you know, massive price deflation. So it's so I'm saying in even, you know, conventional economists working at the Fed, to go back to your earlier question, like, do they realize the potential they have to wreck the economy? They actually do think the Fed caused or exacerbated the, even though, you know, I think Jason, you and I might disagree totally with what their theory is. But so they do re recognize, yeah, we got to be careful. But I think they, you know, they still do believe as, you know, so that's, they don't mean like, don't mess with it because you're just going to make it worse. I think they just think we got to be really careful. So like they view themselves as brain surgeons that, oh yeah, if there's a tumor, we got to go in and get it, but, you know, make sure you don't cut out the wrong thing. I think for a, a lot of uh, libertarians out there, people who are just starting to learn the Austrian school, they think that all these interest rate hikes are a good thing, but actually they're causing even more distortions because you had this enormous bubble. And then all of a sudden, after basically putting um, foot, foot, uh, foot to the pedal on the gas pedal, max accelerator hitting the red line, all of a sudden the Fed just slams on the brakes. So the car is going to, there's going to be an enormous car accident and the car is spinning out of control. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, it's, it is a tricky issue, you know, to, so I think, you know, the standard 
view, um, certainly among Austrian economists and then like from a libertarian political philosophy to say like, well, what would it mean to not engage in coercion when it comes to money and banking is that, yeah, there shouldn't be a central bank at all. It, it should never have been interfering in the first place that, you know, we wouldn't be in this position if there had never been, you know, given that the central bank blows up this bubble, then what do you do right when it's about to burst? Um, and and so, yeah, there's different views as to, you know, what's the best way to do that? Just like, um, I don't know if, if this is partly what you have in mind, Jason, but like after the inflation of World War One, right? So going on the eve of the First World War, all the major governments of the world were on the classical gold standard. And, you know, and they all had their currencies pegged to gold at a certain ratio. Then during the war years, most of them, you know, greatly inflated. The U.S. was the only one that at least nominally stayed on, you know, the standard. And then after, you know, they stopped and everything. And so then the question was, should they just revalue like the British pound? Should they just let it now, you know, peg it at the new deflate, you know, depreciated value? But what they tried to do in practice was to go back to the pre-war parity. And that involved massive deflation in order, you know, to like basically destroy a bunch of the pounds that had been created during the war years in order to get it to be back to its old gold. And so and so Mises had an analogy saying, you know, that the inflation was like running over a guy forward. And then now the deflation is like putting the car in reverse and backing up over him to try to undo the damage. And that no, that does twice as much damage. But so if yeah. And our listener for our listeners out there, they think that a lot of Austrian school libertarians are in favor of a gold or silver standard. That's better than what we have now, but that's still a government controlled price fix. Uh, so government's still setting price controls on the gold price there. So yeah, it might be better than what we have now, but it's still not a free gold price. So what you said, Robert, is that you have a team of uh, people in the finance ministry or central bank or government deciding on an arbitrary number for the gold price. And obviously they're not going to get it right. I mean, in 1934, FDR wanted to fight deflation. So he he was tinkering with the gold price in US dollars. And then he, then he just decided in 1934 to devalue the dollar by about 60, almost 70% against gold. Right. So, um, I mean, there, there's different le- levels of it. So you're, I agree with you, Jason. I, I used to, like as a sort of practical, pragmatic measure to say, hey, given that we're not going to have, you know, Rothbardy and anarcho-capitalism next Thursday, in the interim, you know, maybe the, the federal government should just target a certain dollar price of gold. And I had, you know, I came up with some principle, but I have since stopped saying that because the, the main reason is that I realized, you know, I, I would sit there and, and put all this effort into it and, you know, try to enlist people to support my cause. And we'd all, and let's say we pull off the impossible and got the government to do that, you know, lock in gold at whatever $1,800 an ounce or who knows what. And then as soon as another emergency came along, they would just go off that new peg, right? You know, they would come up with a reason and say, oh, we can't stay on the peg right now because this emergency or a war or whatever. Yeah. And, so, and that would totally discredit it. And so I, so that's why I just stopped doing that. Yeah. Um, so there, there, I, I do want to make a distinction, though. So it, you're, you're right. Like, um, like it's, you know, some dictatorship somewhere and they, and they, they overvalue their currency and they put in currency control. So if, Back on the gold standard, like they weren't saying it's illegal. I mean, FDR was, don't get me wrong, but I'm saying back on the you know, like what people mean by a classical gold standard, you were allowed to trade at any price you wanted. It wasn't the government was going to fine you or punish you. It was just they were saying if you turn it, you know, we will give you an ounce of gold if you give us twenty dollars and sixty seven cents, for example, in the U.S. case before World War One, right? So, um, so it, it wasn't that they were saying it's illegal for you to trade. For, for gold below or above this price, they were just saying it was sort of defining the dollar based on that much. So it was a way of, um, you know, just defining what a dollar was. So if the government picks and chooses the wrong price for gold or silver, I mean, FDR, I think, set the silver price too high and he caused hyperinflation in China. So they were stockpiling silver during the Great Depression as one of their um, anti-deflation measures. And so they were buying all this silver from the silver miners to prevent the silver miners from going bankrupt. They were paying above the market price. And actually, all the silver from a lot of different countries, China and many other countries that were on a silver standard, caused all the silver to come to the United States. So the U.S. got over a billion ounces of silver stockpile by, I think, uh, the early 1940s. So 
So it just shows the government arbitrarily setting a price either too high or too low. If the government sets the price too low, Bob, with a gold standard, you said 1800 for for this case study. I mean, if they set the price at 1800 and we have another 10 years of gold mining and the costs go up and the grades go down for gold mining, then 1800 is too low of a price because there's not um, economic gold at 1800 anymore. And then that would cause a shortage. <laughs> Oh, I mean, right. So, I, I get, so again, I'm, I'm not disagreeing with your the spirit of what you're saying. The big picture that, yeah, what, having them pick, there's no reason to do that. Just like, you know, I don't think there's they should be in the business of picking something called a dollar and defining it. Just let you know the market figure out what what the money is and so on. That, that's really the the true laissez faire solution, I think. So I agree with you there. Um, but but just so you, the listeners understand, you're, you're right. So if they if they pick some, you know, eighteen hundred whatever it is. And then prices rose and it became uneconomical to continue to mine gold at that price. You're, you're right. The mining activity would, would cease. And then so new gold would stop hitting the market. And then that would, you know, total production of everything else would go up over time. And, and, and that would push down, you know, the nominal price of gold until then, it be, you know, so once then it would drop below. So anyway, I'm just saying it, it would, things things would adjust so that, eventually things would resume is all well, I'm saying. But, well, but I, right. I know you covered this in your book, The Politically Incorrect Guide to, to Capitalism, talking about wage and price control. So the government just causes distortions. We're seeing this now with the cost of capital and government setting interest rates. I mean, they have a team of PhD economists. Yeah, Jerome Powell's at the top, but he's also take, looking at the Fed's models and he's looking at the data from the team of the PhD economists at the Fed and trying to pick out what they should keep interest rates at for a while or what they think is the key inflation rate. So I, they're just creating more and more distortions, even with the Federal Reserve Bank interest rate hikes. Oh, right. So yeah, to, to be clear, if if you did have a, a true gold standard, the, the government would not also be picking interest rates. Like the point is, they would just do that one thing and just say, you know, we control the quantity of dollars, and then we are going to always just you know buy and sell gold to maintain a price of whatever the peg is, and then let interest rates just be whatever. They are. So you, you wouldn't do both for sure. So do you think then that it looks like this commercial real estate bubble is the major real estate bubble for this cycle? Because the stuff in the headlines we're seeing out of all the major cities in every major metro area is that the, the buildings are basically 50% or less occupied now. So all these commercial real estate investors, we haven't seen large scale bankruptcies and defaults yet, but I would say it's almost definitely coming if the Federal Reserve Bank keeps interest rates relatively high. But, right, I agree with you. I think um, you know it may it's it's not. I think in re, the residential is not as bad as it was um, like in you know oh six, uh, but yeah, the commercial, the different metrics I looked at, we looked it was pretty overvalued, um, and and so yes, I do think that there's going to be uh, a large you know correction is the euphemism they use. Um, I I don't know if it will be a, obvious to people in real time. But I think like if you go five years in the future and then look backwards, they will say that the this next recession officially began either late 23 or early 24. And with the Austrian theory of the business cycle, we had these artificially cheap interest rates thanks to governments and central banks. It caused a teardown boom, Robert. So I, I've spoken with real estate developers here in the DC metro area, and they've just were bragging about how easy it was to go and borrow and so they'd buy these old houses on expensive land right outside of Washington, D.C., or even downtown in a bad neighborhood, and they would gentrify it. So they it, the land would be worth a lot, but it would be an old house. They'd knock down the house and build a McMansion and try to sell it for over a million dollars. And they were also doing this with the teardown boom because artificially cheap interest rates with one or two floor strip malls or smaller office spaces. And then they'd build these gigantic um, luxury condo buildings or mixed use buildings with a retail or office work on the first couple floors and in luxury condos for the rest of the building. Well, yeah, I mean, so that you you obviously have your hand on the pulse of the commercial market and uh, retail market there more than I do. Um, I was more familiar, like, for example, with the Florida real estate market in there. Yeah. in the residential side, it was so, I mean, so yeah. And back in what, 22, it was no, sorry, in 21, it, it was crazy that, um, you know, people would list a, a house and then within 48 hours, it would be sold for like 50 grand above the list price. You know what I mean? So, so if you went to, and you know, I'd be talking to agents 
And they would say, if you're going to make an offer in a house, the question is just how much above the list price are you going to bid? Because you know, it's, you know, they're, they're getting offers above that. So it was, you know, talking to agents who had been in the business for 30 years, they said they'd never seen anything like it. That was the same thing here in the DC Metro. There was lots of people moving here. At one point, there was over a dozen bids before the, the house officially became listed. So it would be sold in a week, all cash offers, people wouldn't even need a mortgage and people were paying at one point hundreds of thousands of dollars over the asking price. So it sounds like Florida is similar. A lot of people in other states have been moving to Florida, especially since the pandemic. Right. I think that was one of the, the main drivers of it that for various reasons that, yeah, people liked Florida for, you know, the relative freedom and, you know, obviously the weather's always an attractive thing, but, but yes, people were moving there and there was a, a massive influx of people into Florida that was contributing. And like you say, though, the, the rock bottom interest rates were the, the, you know, fuel that kept it going. And now that we have higher interest rates, all these commercial real estate owners that use debt that have a mortgage, they were doing their cash flow projection. So rent would be this, our occupancy rate would be that, entering in a, on their Microsoft Excel spreadsheets. Well, now the interest rates are higher. They're not able to charge the high rents and their occupancy rates are collapsing. None of that math works. So I think we're setting up for a bust. I don't know the exact timing on this, Robert, but probably over the next 6, 12, 18 months, I mean, things are going to get pretty ugly for commercial real estate. Yeah, I think that's right. And it's, you know, real estate has always been um, one of the best ways to sort of illustrate the, the the fundamentals of Austrian business cycle theory that, you know, artificially low interest rates mislead entrepreneurs. It's just it's a classic, you know, with a long lived asset, like a, a house or a, you know, a building property that low interest rates means that, oh, you're willing to pay, you know, more multiples of the, of the rental price for it. And that's, you know, that's clearly what you see here. So I want to transition out to MMT because I've been watching your debates for over a decade against MMT people, but this theory won't die. I don't think it's modern. I, I've seen this theory originate. Uh, I've read about this theory originating. It was called originally, I think, chartalism. So it was even before mercantilism or around the time of mercantilism. Well, well there's different variants of it, but yeah, yeah I mean, the more modern chartal, it, it certainly goes back to or at least to the um, early 1900s for sure. And then different versions of it, yeah, go back further depending on who you want to, you know, point to as the founder. So this theory has been gaining enormous popularity. It seems it gives the politicians and the bureaucrats in these governments an excuse to just spend more, and then the central bank just monetizes the debt. And the mon modern monetary theorists say that if it creates inflation, they'll just tax us more. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it's um. It, it, it's really tricky, you know, and whether it's intentional or, you know, they, they mean well, and it's just, there's a difference of, you know, we're talking past each other, but I always find it, it's, I guess, slippery is the right word when I'm debating or talking to these people, because on the one hand, they're saying, no, 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 we're just doing, you know, accounting tautologies. And, you know, there's no, this is just, you know, math or accounting. And, you know, there's no, and, and all we're saying is that, um, you know, for a, a government that issues its own sovereign currency in which its debts are denominated in that currency, that it, it can't run into a debt crisis. You know, so for the case of the United States, they'll say, stop saying, you know, oh, can we afford to pay for Social Security? They say, of course we can. What do you mean? We have a printing press and all the debts are denominated in U.S. dollars. So we, it's not like we're going to run out of U.S. dollars. It's not like a household or a corporation. That's the, you know, that's the essential insight of MMT. Let's just start there and move forward. And, the, and so people say, oh, so we could just pay for anything? And they say, well, well, no, if, if we can, if we, if they print too much money, if they spend too much, then ultimately, yes, that once you hit up the, the, against the scarcity of you know, the actual scarcity of natural resources and labor and so on, then you'd see prices start to skyrocket and that would be the signal. But so long as we have low price inflation, we can just keep, you know, printing money and spending more. And don't let these debt mongers scare us off. But as you say, Jason, so they did that. And then we saw consumer price inflation, you know, break 8%. And it's not like they all of a sudden said, oh, okay, let's back off now. Like, I, you know, I've, I've been watching the feeds of Stephanie Kelt and the other MMT. Somebody asked her, is this sustainable? And she said, yes. So, you know, it's, I think most households wouldn't think that price is rising at 8%. And that's the official rate, as, as we talked about earlier. We think the real rate's higher. You know, people go to the grocery store and see how much more expensive that is. If that just kept happening indefinitely, I don't think most people would consider that sustainable. So 
it's a bit of a bait and switch. Yeah, I think Stephanie Kelton, she she's book smart. She's a academic, but I honestly think she's delusional. I mean, I guess maybe her income with getting all these consulting jobs from Wall Street investment banks and hedge funds and the think tanks here in DC that are paying her a six figure, seven figure year extra salary for all these speaking engagements. Her income is rising faster than the inflation rate. So I guess she doesn't notice that she's getting killed with stagflation, shrinkflation, and taxes in the real economy. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm sure that there is a lot of that involved, and you're right. I'm glad you brought the shrinkflation stuff too, because yeah, it's it's not merely how much the sticker prices are higher, but anybody who who does the grocery shopping for the household knows over the past few years that yeah, you're getting way less food in the packaging. If you're buying something like paper towels or whatever, it's a lot thinner than it used to be. So they really are cutting corners on a lot of areas, and so it's 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 not just the the sticker shock, even though the sticker shock is there. I mean. You can't even get out of Walmart now with your normal family without spending more than $100, even if you don't buy any meat, which, you know, that that didn't used to be the case. And unfortunately, I think both political parties are kind of open to MMT. I know the Republicans tend to be supply siders, but I view supply side economics as also kind of a version of government intervention, too, because they're still they're not really cutting government spending. They're just borrowing more debt and they're um, doing private sector tax cuts. So the government's not actually cutting back. But both political parties seem kind of into this neo-Keynesian and MMT type because it just justifies the spending that the politicians, the bureaucrats already want to do. Yeah, so for sure on the supply side, I, I totally understand where you're coming from that they're, they sort of, you know, it's it's like, yeah, so what they're saying is correct in that, hey, in, instead of, you know, raising tax rates to try to squeeze more out of the rich and then to spend more. Why don't you lower the rate and then, you know, revenues either might even go up or at least they won't go down as much as you thought they would have. And that's a way to, you know, to to spend more that way um, that's more sustainable in the long run. But you're right that that ultimately kind of fuels more uh, deficit spending, um, which certainly happened during the, the 80s. It wasn't you know, just so people understand tax revenues went up over the 80s, even though rates you know, were cut significantly in certain taxes in the beginning. Um, but it's just that under the Reagan administration's spending went up even more, right? So just to make sure people understand that. Um, so there's that element. Um, and yeah, there are some people even that you would consider on the right that, that do, they, they are with the MMT stuff. So, so some of them don't, some of them think it's crazy. Um, but yeah, you're right. There are some like writers at National Review and whatnot that um, they they do seem to be enamored with some of the accounting tricks of the MMT folks. Yeah, I just view MMT as very similar to kind of neo-Keynesian because it's kind of just multiplying and expanding on a lot of the stuff that Keynes was suggesting when he wrote the general theory about 100 years ago. I mean, it's basically just totalitarian government or hardcore fascism where government has way too much control over the economy, the money supply, wage and price controls, all these different things. Well, well, right. So certainly from that element, you're you're right that uh, standard Keynesianism and MMT are you know, in, in the same neighborhood versus, you know, Austrian economics or something that's that's far away from it in terms of the ideological space or what, however you want to categorize it in terms of justification for government intervention. Um, what's interesting, though, is like Paul Krugman, for example, has done battle with Stephanie Kelton and others. And the, the distinction is Krugman thinks all the normal rules of scarcity go out the window when there's a so-called liquidity trap. But once interest rates are above 0%, then he does think that, oh, yeah, government spending crowds out private investments and so on, whereas the MMT people, that's not how they think, right? So it's almost like the MMT people are like Krugman is during a liquidity trap all the time. Well, Keynesian economics, in my view, it just creates its own liquidity trap. So they're pulling all these levers. They're doing all the in interventions, bailouts. They're spending money. They're increasing the government debt. And so then they cause like a credit boom and then a bust. And then they say, look, there's a liquidity problem. There's deflation. There's bankruptcies. We have to do even more. We have to intervene more. We have to print more money. We have to do more bailouts. We have to go and save the economy. Oh, right. So I definitely agree with you that like in their framework, you know, they're just chugging along. And geez, that all of a sudden for no reason, you know, private investment and spending just fall off a cliff and unemployment zooms up. And no matter how low interest rates get slashed, you know, private investment's not going to fill that hole. And so that's why we need a government to come in. 
And you're right. It's their, their alleged remedies that are just setting up the next boom bust cycle. So they would just stop putting in the quote medicine, then the economy would recover and these crises would stop magically happening for no reason. Because it's actually not for no reason. It's because of what they think they're doing to fix things. They're just setting us up for the next crash. And we've had about 100 years of either Keynesian or neo-Keynesian economics implemented here in the United States. So uh, I, I would love to, uh, excuse me, I would love for Keynesian economics to basically go away, but just all these variations and bastardizations of it. And there's a lot of people saying, oh, this isn't real Keynesian economics, just like the same people who say, oh, we're not doing, they haven't ever done any real socialism. Um, I, I It's just ridiculous, though, because now we have neo-Keynesian and MMT people, and these are all variations of just government, more, more and more government control, and the governments and central banks have way too much power over, over individual freedoms in the economy at this point. Well, yeah, you're exactly right. And that's, I mean, we have always have this, this game where, um, you know, the, the Keynesians will say, oh, it was a good thing that FDR ran big budget deficits in the 30s. And then you say, okay, well, he did that. And look at that. That was the longest, you know, economic depression in U.S. history. And then they'll say, well, it's because he didn't do enough. Right. But if, if, if he hadn't done that, or like, you know, the Obama stimulus package, the economy, unemployment was worse with that package than what the, what the proponents of the package were warning would happen if, if we did nothing. And so it's like, okay, what more would have to happen to show that your alleged remedy made things worse? And they just say, well, the economy was in worse shape than we realized. So, you know, they're always sure government deficit spending helps boost employment. And even if unemployment goes up after they do it, they'll just say, well, it's because we didn't do enough. And so, you know, you're kind of in this impasse. Yeah, they've they've created their own vicious cycle here where they justify their uh, their needs to keep intervening more and more and spending more and more and government takes more and more control over the size of the economy. I think depending upon how you measure it, Robert, the U.S. federal government spending is around 50 percent of GDP now. At all levels, you're saying? Um, well, they're not the current GDP. They're not even accounting for the CPI inflation rate because they use a deflator. But yeah, I mean, I've seen the estimates in certain places like 2019 to 2020. It was already close to 50 percent for U.S. federal government spending of GDP. It's even worse in other countries, actually. Yeah, I, yeah, I, I know it's for sure worse in other countries. Yeah, you you might be. I haven't actually looked at it re recently. Um, yeah, definitely. If, if if you include spending at, at various levels, then it's certainly in in that ballpark for sure. Uh, my last question here, I want to ask about deflation because when I read Austrian school economics, it seems that deflation is good for consumers. It's good for people in the long term. It promotes savings because of your currency, your purchasing power, your currency goes up. Deflation means that the economy is taking care of the malinvestment, the waste, but the government, the Keynesians, the PhD economists seem to hate deflation. So why do you think they hate deflation? Well, um, so right, yeah, the baseline, just to under for listeners who haven't heard of the theory, that, yeah, in a normal functioning economy um, where, you know, the money is is created privately, let's say whether it's gold being mined or, you know, if you're on a cryptocurrency or whatever it is, that, yeah, no, the normal state of affairs, and, and there were long stretches in actual history where this was the case, is that the money stock, you know, might be growing or, or relatively stagnant, and then the re real output of goods and services goes up year after year because of productivity increases, and so that means the unit price of most things gently falls over time. So workers' wages would stay the same, you know, in nominal terms, but everything would just get a little bit cheaper all the time, and so the workers would be able to buy more and more with their same paycheck, and, and you know that that could be a healthy economy that has tech, you know, technically has deflation. Um, measured in terms of falling prices. So the reason a lot of you know central bankers and standard Keynesians they they don't like deflation, I think it's largely because of an association bias where in really bad economic times, historically, people would panic, they'd pull their money out of the banks, the money supply would shrink. And so it was associated with deflation, right? So in other words, there were periods where falling prices tended to go hand in hand. With bad financial crises, you know, people are panicking. They hoard money would be the term they would use. And so spending would drop and prices would fall. And so I think a lot of Keynesians believe that, oh, that's why falling prices are so bad. And so, you know, in order to provide stability and avoid panics, you want prices to be gently rising over time is what they think.
except prices have been more than just gently rising over time. <laughs> the Federal Reserve, what one of their official mandates was price stability, and they botched that completely and totally. I mean, the dollar, the dollar's worth under, uh, it's worth de been devalued by over 97% since the Federal Reserve Bank was created. Well, well right. So, it, and that's like a word game they play where, you know, the phrase price stability eventually somehow got transformed to mean like predictable and moderate depreciation of the dollar, right? In other words, like, it's not that they are going to keep the dollar's price constant or value constant. We're just going to make sure that it erodes at a predictable and not too extreme rate. But but you're right. That's that's not what stability means. So I, I think the other reason, and they won't say this publicly, the other major reason that the Keynesians and the government officials hate deflation, they can't tax it. So if you're actually benefiting, if the value of your savings is going up, if you're getting more purchasing power, the government can't tax that. They can tax, if the stock market goes up a lot, they can tax that more with capital gains taxes. If the bond market increases, they can tax that with capital gains taxes. If real estate prices double over the last 15 or 20 years, because the Federal Reserve Bank was doing the wealth effect, right, which is really just the Cantillon effect and asset price inflation, then they can really tax that with property taxes at the state and local government level. And then when you sell your house, then the government, federal government gets enormous capital gains taxes. So I think they're, unfortunately, the incentive structure is in place for the government to hate deflation so they can do asset price inflation and take more in tax revenues. Yeah, I think you're right about all that. And also, um, if there's a so-called progressive income tax, that just as people's nominal wages or salaries go up, they get pushed into higher tax brackets. So there's that element. Um, and also, too, given that there's an outstanding stock of government debt, if they if they have rising prices, that reduces the real value of it. So effectively, they can inflate away you know the real burden of the debt. So that's another incentive for why they would want other things equal. Um, you know, see rising prices. Oh, yeah, I totally agree with inflating the debt away. So the government says that they're fighting inflation now, raising interest rates. But look, interest payments on the debt are around $900 billion. So if they keep interest rates at these levels or keep raising them, they're going to take up the most of the annual tax receipts are going to be spent on just interest payments on the debt and uh, funding the military budget. I mean, the federal government, most of their spending is not going to be covered by the tax receipts at some point. Yeah. And, and again, this is for people who haven't seen it. This is not you know, gloom and doom, looking at crazy, you know, right wing websites, you look at the CBO's own forecast, and they're showing that the government debt relative to the size of the economy is going to continue rising just because of what you said, Jason, that is interest rate and not like because of a spike in interest rates due to some calamity, just as they gradually return to quote normal levels that, yeah, the interest on the outstanding debt is just kind of like a runaway train that it just is going to keep getting to be a bigger and bigger share such that eventually that's going to be, you know, one of the biggest components of the whole budget. And there's so much waste, fraud, corruption and abuse in the D.C. metro area and in bailouts of large, too big to fail banks, large corporations. Robert, it seems like we're just seeing the cancel on effect just play out over the last 15 or 20 years. It's just gotten absolutely insane, the level of currency and credit that's been given out to large banks, corporations, and in spending here in D.C. An article I wrote um, for this this collection on, that was talking about Federal Reserve, or it was like, I think it was called like the Federal Reserve at 100 years old or something like that that you know, came out, as you can imagine, 2013. And mine was, um, I think it said, Ben Bernanke is the FDR of central bankers. And my point was that the the types of things the Fed was now doing was were, were qualitatively more interventionist than before. So be, you know, before the 2008 crisis, the Fed was basically just supposed to buy treasuries, and that was it. And so then you know, but after the crisis, you know, they got into mortgage backed securities, and then people were talking about them just in general buying, you know, bonds issued by particular companies and you know, buying uh, municipal bonds and things like that. So it's just gotten to the point now where when, whenever there's any kind of economic calamity, people's go-to reaction is, well, what if the Fed just gets involved there? So I'm just, it's, it's now the Fed has become this magical genie that's just supposed to get us out of our problems. Well, they're they're in charge of bailing people out so people don't have investment losses. <laughs> or or you have the Fed governors, all these scandals that have come out the last two years, the Fed governors and even Jerome Powell himself, they were front running all their trades. So they knew what the Fed was going to buy with the QE programs, either municipal bonds, mortgage backed securities, 
uh, corporate bonds, other stuff. So the Fed governors were buying these things ahead of time before the QE purchases started. So they made themselves millions of dollars extra in profits and no one's going to prison. Yeah, I mean, and that, that was this kind of stuff is partly why, you know, those original structures were in place. There's a thing, too, that I had in that, that essay I just told you about where um, I saw this legal analysis, you know, like in the law journal. And they were so the, there's these the, the Fed created these entities called Maiden Lane LLCs, you know, limited liability corps. And the, the reason was because the Fed is not supposed to be, you know, they're just supposed to be lending. They're not supposed to be buying assets. Um, and and so the it was the Maiden Lane LLCs that were technically buying the mortgage backed securities and the Fed would lend to the LLC to the, you know what I'm saying? So it was anyway. It, sound, it, it was it sounds a, like accounting fraud, Robert. It sounds like they're, they're kind of Enron or one of these uh, Wall Street too big to fail banks, and they set up like a, a shell company or a dummy company <laughs> off their balance sheet. Like, oh, we set up dummy company LLC, and we're going to move the assets there. Wink, wink, nod, nod. <laughs> Wait, yeah, exactly. So it was a way that they could legally, you know, say, hey, we're not violating the statute. We're allowed to lend to whoever we want. We're not lending this LLC. We're not buying mortgage-backed securities. We're not allowed to do that. We can't hold it. And yet, if you go to the Fed's balance sheet, it you know lists the much back securities on the balance sheet. So um, anyway, yeah, there's little tricks like that where it's it's not really that I disagree economically with what they're doing. It's like this is arguably illegal. Uh, well, DC, there's tons of white shoe lawyers here. Most of the politicians in DC and the lobbyists all have law degrees. So what's the thing about lawyers? They want to change the laws. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Well, Robert, I really enjoyed our conversation today. If my listeners want to take a look at your books or articles or follow you on Twitter or take a look at your new podcast, how did they do so? Oh, sure. Thanks for having me. Um, I guess just if, if they go to bobmurphyshow.com, that's you know my my podcast's um, website. And then that has, and, and I'm at Bob Murphy Econ is my Twitter handle. And th those two places, you'll be able to find all my stuff. And I recommend Robert's beginner's book, The Politically Incorrect Guide to Capitalism. And also definitely check out his speeches over the years on the Mises Institute YouTube channel. Lots of good stuff over there if you want to learn Austrian school economics. It's a very appropriate time because we're just seeing kind of, unfortunately, another Austrian boom and bust cycle play out as the Fed keeps interest rates high. And people are saying how good it is, but it's just going to cause an absolute bust and even more distortions in the economy. And you know, at some point, I don't know if it's three months, six months, nine months, 12 months, the Fed is going to come in here because the politicians are going to put pressure on them. The business, the real estate developers are going to put pressure on them or the banks are going to put pressure on them and say, we need you to go buy this stuff. I don't know if it's uh, commercial real estate. I, I, God, God only knows what the Fed's going to do or or the loans the Fed's going to give out to BlackRock or these banks to go and buy the commercial real estate after a crash. Yeah, I, I think you're right to be worried about things that, you know, 10 years ago would have been inconceivable. But at this point, anything is possible. Like you say, they're, just, you know, bailing, you know, putting a floor under every depositor, no matter how big. So, yeah, there's the sky's the limit at this point. Well, they're, they're just playing fast and loose with all the rules and they're moving the goalposts and changing the rules whenever they need it. So if you're a business owner or an investor and you are you think that the rules are a certain way, all of a sudden they're changed and then you have to keep paying attention to all these rules changes now. Yeah, it, it's very difficult to keep up. You know, so you got your normal business fundamentals and on top of that, you got to guess what's the Fed going to do next month. Or who they're going to bail out. I mean, look at what happened with Silicon Valley Bank. So initially, what the FDIC limits were 250000 But most of the people who had cash at Silicon Valley Bank, there were people who had way over that limit. And then, of course, they were uh, complaining they wanted the rules changed. Right, exactly. And so, yeah, I think that's going to be a, a bad precedent because now anytime these banks get in trouble, and as you say, as they're raising rates, if they keep doing that, more banks might be in trouble too that you know there was a reason silicon valley bank got hit particularly hard with the interest rate hikes and so then you know they're going to be in a time that they just keep bailing out everybody or at some point did they say no and then those people will complain and say well geez we, we were led to believe that you'd bail us out too and so it's it's a, a lose lose at this point and i think that's why a lot of foreigners foreign central banks also because the russian reserves were confiscated that's why they're not buying a lot of u.s treasuries because they see all these bailouts and policy changes and they're like, well, if we just buy U.S. Treasuries and the people in D.C. and the Federal Reserve Bank are going to do this stuff with mismanaging the dollar and U.S. government finances and and who knows the size of the bailouts, why should I keep buying many years worth of U.S. Treasuries when the U.S. government's going to intentionally try to devalue them? But, right. Yeah. I mean, that's I, I think you're, they're 
foreign holders are in a quandary where they don't want to keep accumulating them. And they're concerned though, if they're a big player that if, if it looks like they're dumping treasuries, they could cause a run themselves. So it's a tricky situation we're in. 